Brethren, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And we also heard in the Holy Gospel these beautiful words. Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. In the mid-14th century, that's the 1300s, Blessed Raymond of Capua, the spiritual director of St. Catherine of Siena, he was doubting the special graces and favors that were granted to this great saint. And so he decided to put her to the test. And you can't blame him. If you saw St. Catherine and all the things she was doing, you would wonder, is this real? Am I seeing things? It's so fantastic, some of the things. So he wanted to put her to the test. And he asked her for the favor of feeling a great and extraordinary contrition for his sins. Now, he knew that when contrition for sins rise up in the heart, this is always a great sign of the grace of God. In other words, he knew that the devil would never and could not, for that fact, grant such a request. The devil does not grant contrition for sins. He wants you to sin more, not less. The next day, as he was talking to the saint, there came before his mind an unusual vision of his sins, such that the cataracts of my flinty heart, he wrote, were loosed and fountains of water overflowed to lay bare the depth of my sins. I burst out into tears so violently that I say it with shame, I almost felt my heart would break. Catherine, in her wisdom, having come for this very purpose, no sooner saw the state I was in that she stopped talking and let me go on crying and sobbing. After a while, still crying, I began to wonder about this strange event, and then I remembered what I had asked her for the previous evening and the promise she had made. Is this the contrition I asked for yesterday, I asked her? It is, she replied, and getting up, and if I remember rightly, tapping me on the shoulders, she said, Never forget the graces of God. St. Catherine had a way about her of making people remember or know their sins. That's why she had four confessors about her at all times. Because when she looked at people, they would see their sins and they would run to confession. Now, what if this same grace that was granted to Raymond of Capua were granted to us? What would we do about it? What would it be like to see all our sins? Hmm. Consider for a moment finding yourself in a certain room in which the walls are covered with small index card files. You know, like the ones we used to find in libraries listing titles by author or subject in alphabetical order. But these files, which stretched from floor to ceiling in this room and in every direction, have very different headings. Upon examination, you might read something like this. People I have liked. Friends I have betrayed. The titles covered everything and they were exact. Books I have read. Lies I have told. Jokes I have laughed at. Things I have done in anger. Things I have muttered under my breath. Upon entering this room, one man gave this account. He said, I opened a drawer and began to flip through the cards. I quickly shut it, shocked to realize that I recognized the contents written on each one. And then in a flash, I knew exactly where I was. This lifeless room with its small filing system was a catalog for my life. Here were written the actions and thoughts of my every moment, big and small, in a detail my memory could not match. I continued to look and I never ceased to be surprised by the contents. Often there were many more cards than I expected. Alas, other times there were fewer than I hoped for. A sense of wonder and curiosity coupled with horror stirred within me as I began randomly opening files and exploring their contents. Some brought joy and sweet memories, others a sense of shame and regret. So intense 
that I would look over my shoulder to see if anyone was watching. What is more, I was nearly overwhelmed by the sheer volume of the life I had lived. Could it be possible that I had the time in my 30 years to write each of these thousands or even millions of cards? But there it was. Each card confirmed this truth. Each card was written in my own handwriting. Each was signed with my own signature. When I pulled out the file marked Songs I Have Listened To, I realized the files grew to contain their contents. The cards were packed tightly in this card file, and yet after two or three yards, I hadn't found the end of the file. I shut it, shamed, not only at the quality of music, but also by the vast amount of time I knew that file represented. Nearby, I saw a file bearing the title, Time I Have Spent in Prayer. The handle was brighter than those around it, newer and almost unused. I pulled on its handle, and a small box, not more than three inches, came into my hands. I could easily count the cards it contained. When I came across the file marked, Lustful Thoughts and Actions, I felt a chill run through my body. I pulled the file out only an inch, not willing to test its size, and drew out a card. I shuddered at its detailed content. I felt sick to think that such a moment had been recorded. An almost animal rage broke upon me. One thought dominated my mind. No one must ever see these cards. No one must ever see this room. I have to destroy them. In a frenzy, I yanked out the file. Its size did not matter now. I had to empty it and burn the cards, no matter what. But as I took it at one end and began pounding it on the floor, I could not dislodge any of the cards. I became desperate and pulled out a single card with great effort, only to find it as strong as steel when I tried to tear it up. It could not be destroyed. Defeated and utterly helpless, I returned the file to its slot, leaned my forehead against the wall, and let out a long, self-pitying sigh. I cried out, No one must ever know of this room. I must lock it up and hide the key. But then, someone did come in at that moment. And I knew immediately it was His Majesty, our Lord. I watched helplessly as He began to open the files and read the cards. I couldn't bear to watch... And in the moments I could bring myself to look on his face, I saw deep sorrow. He seemed to go intuitively to the worst boxes. Now why did he have to read every one of them? Finally, he turned and looked at me with compassion in his eyes from across the room. I dropped my head, covered my face with my hands, and then the sorrow came. Remember? Our Lord looked at St. Peter, and what happened? Oh, the sorrow came. I began to weep. I fell on my knees and cried. I cried out of sorrow and from the overwhelming shame of it all. I wept for having offended God so deeply. He walked over and said, Be of good heart, my son. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Then he got up and walked back to the wall of files groaning, as we heard him do in the gospel recently. He started at one end of the room and at one by one began to sign his name over mine on each card in an ink that was rich, dark red. The holy name of Jesus covered my name and it was written with his blood. I don't think I'll ever understand how he did it so quickly. But the next instant, it seemed I heard him close the last file and walk back to my side. He placed his hand on my shoulder and said, It is finished. Your sins are forgiven you. Arise, go and sin no more. I stood up and he led me out of the room and there were still cards to be written, thanks be to God. Now over the last few Sundays, we've been reflecting on the wonder of that is the Holy Mass, perfect prayer, the representation of Calvary. 
Now we can reflect a moment on how the priest is empowered to take the precious blood from the consecration and mystically apply it in the other sacraments to our souls, most especially in the confessional. But note how the words of the second consecration at the Mass indicate this reality. It speaks specifically of the chalice being poured out, using the Latin word effundetur, for the remission of sins. So it's being poured out, not the blood, the chalice is being poured out. It's referring to the chalice. So the priest gets the chalice mystically and he has it in his hand. He goes in confession or the baptismal font and he pours it out. Comes from the Mass. So just as only a priest can consecrate at the altar, only a priest can absolve sins in confession. You have to be able to consecrate to forgive sins, absolve sins in the confessional. Now the room we just visited gives us a clear way of seeing how this sacrament works and why it is needed. There are five parts to consider. Number one, we acknowledge our sins through an examination of conscience. Our blessed Lord taught us, know the truth and the truth will make you free. So the first step in our being set free from the bondage of sin is the recognition of our sins in complete humility and truth. It's visiting that room and opening those drawers and looking at those cards and saying, yes, I did that. The story indicates this when the man acknowledges the cards belong to himself and not to somebody else. Each was written in my own handwriting, he said. Each signed with my own signature. I did this. Second of all, we are sorry for our sins. The sorrow must be of the will, not just of the emotions. In other words, even if we do not feel sorry for our sins, we must be sorry for our sins in our heart and in our will. And we must be sorry at least for each and every mortal sin, if we have any to confess. There was a book written some time ago. It was called... The World of Flesh and Father Smith. And there's an error in that book, and I've heard it recently repeated. It's disturbing. If my memory serves, in that book he's confessing a man that's not sorry for his sins. And so he said, well, are you at least sorry for not being sorry? Oh, yes, Father, I'm sorry for not being sorry. Well, that's good enough. And he gives him absolution. Uh, that's not enough. You have to be sorry for each mortal sin as best you can. And if you're not sorry, then you pray for it. And you beg God. And Mary Magdalene is a good one to pray to, too. Our Lady of Sorrows, help me be sorry for my sins. We must be sorry. And the story displays this when the man weeps over his sins. And it says, and then the sorrow came. Third of all, we must confess our sins to a priest who acts in persona Christi Capitis. That is, in the person of Christ the head. Once again, just as the priest is the one who can consecrate, he's the one that can pour out the chalice on your soul. Did not our blessed Lord give this power to the apostles, who in turn passed it on to us down the line so that we could have access to it even today in our time? We read in St. John's Gospel how His Majesty breathed on them and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. How can we retain sins or forgive sins, absolve them, if we don't hear them confess? It's obvious. That's our requirement. So this part of the sacrament is represented in the story by the fact that our Lord read each card. I watched helplessly, it said, as he began to open the files and read the cards. If we went before St. Catherine of Siena, she would see all our sins and we'd go and tell them all to our Lord because he already saw them. If we went to Padre Pio, he would say, oh yeah, you did this, 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 and this, and this. He's reading all our cards. Fourth of all, if our confessions are to be valid, they must be integral. An integral confession is one in which we confess all our mortal sins, 
in kind and number. I did this so many times. I missed Sunday Mass so many times. Never forget, the only mortal sin that cannot be forgiven in the confessional is the one that's not brought there or the one that is purposely left out. Occasionally, someone will say, well, these are the sins I'm prepared to confess. These are the ones I'm ready to confess. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? These are the ones you're prepared and ready to confess. You have other sins. You must confess them all. It's all or nothing. If it's mortal, you got to confess every single one as best you can. As best you can. Sometimes we forget. That's understandable. You must not play a shell game in confession. You confess everything. That's how it is. If you're going to get absolution, it's going to be valid. If you don't confess all the mortal sins, guess what? That's an invalid confession and you just added a huge sin onto your other sins. It's called sacrilege. How can our blessed Lord sign his name over our sins if we're not willing to give the sin to him in confession? In the story, this part of confession is represented as follows. Why did he have to read everyone? He started at one end of the room and one by one began to sign his name over mine on each card. And it was written with his blood. We too can have our Lord write off our sins by taking advantage of the sacrament of confession. In this sacrament, the precious blood of our Savior is applied in time to our souls to wipe away all sins present there. So note that we can confess our venial sins inside or outside of confession and receive forgiveness as long as we're sorry for them. That's why we have the confitio at Mass. That's why we have the indulgentium. That's for the venial sins. That can be done outside of confession, but this is not true of mortal sins. They must be brought to the confessional. St. John Vianney once said, the sins we try to hide always reappear. To hide one's sins well, one must confess them well. And finally, number five, we must complete the confession by doing our penance and resolving to amend our lives. We must satisfy the justice of God by at least starting the process of paying the debt of punishment incurred by our sins. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things will be added unto you. We must do penance. So, not only do we do the penance that's given to us by the priest, but we seek to do other penances too, to keep ourselves from falling again. We must strive not to commit the same sins over and over and we must seek to amend our lives. So the story represents this by saying, there were still cards to be written. Fear not to approach the confessional. Maybe you're afraid. I don't blame you. It's a certain spiritual nakedness. It's not easy. But fear not to approach the confessional by keeping in mind that the Lamb of God awaits you with His blood to remove your sins, to write them off. The St. Therese, a little flower... She expressed it this way. Our Lord is the perfection of perfectness. Nevertheless, he has one great infirmity, if I may dare say it. He is blind. And there's one thing he does not know. He does not know arithmetic. If he could see and calculate properly, our sins would constrain him to annihilate us. But instead, his love for us makes him positively blind but to produce this blindness and prevent him from making a simple addition sum, you must know how to capture his heart. This is his weak side. That's what the priest does at Mass. He captures his heart. He's got it in his hand. And he's willing to give you that heart in the confessional. We capture the sacred heart in the confessional. Once this merciful heart has bled for us, God becomes blind and unable to add up our sins. Take advantage of the sacrament of confession now by confessing all your sins to Him who takes no pleasure in the death of a sinner, but rather that He should turn from His way and live. Let us work toward making our minds and hearts places for God and God alone where we seek first the kingdom of God and His justice even as we go about our daily affairs, so that on the day of judgment, we will not be ashamed to walk 
with our Lord through all the thoughts and actions of our entire lives that are cataloged so accurately in that room. May He find us faithful in all things, ever seeking first the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.